Thank you, Robert. I love your presentation. <laughs> uh, it's nice because you, yeah, it's always nice that someone tries to pick some fragments and try to rebuild a story. It's something that I'm always kind of doing. But before starting, I want to ask you like something. Uh, if you come closer, your experience of this talk will be better. I need to tell you that. <laughs> because if you are really far away, I think it will be yeah, considerable, considerably worse experience. Maybe not completely, but I think it will be enhanced if you are nearby. And this I don't say it for like a... closer to me, but also because you will see, it's very practical. And the second thing that I want to ask you is to have some patience in terms of tonight I will share with you certain artworks that you will be able to touch and to take on your hands, but I please ask you to respect them, like to treat them properly, in terms that, yeah, this is a collection that goes on, so this is not the only presentation of these artworks. That's just the, what I wanted to say to you. But, okay, let's, I will catch up a little bit with what Godard said. So I am doing this advertisement for a Metropolis, that kiosk commission, so Kiosk buys like one quarter of a page in the Metropolis M magazine, and they invite an artist to fill this uh, advertisement. But you are not, you don't need to do a marketing for Kiosk, or you don't, don't need to advertise Kiosk, but it's more for you to do whatever you want. So every artist decides how to do this. And for the ones who have been reading the Metropolis M magazine, in the last months, we go now for the fifth issue, if I'm not wrong. I have been collaborating the whole year with, the, with Kiosk. And what I have been doing is that I started a crossword. A crossword for the Metropolis M magaz magazine. It's a little bit weird because it's in, it is in the section of advertisement. But I was thinking how to break this uh, advertisement section. It was difficult because anything that you place there it sounds like you are advertising something. If it is not an exhibition, it is an artist. If it is not an artist, it is a series of talks. If it is not a series of talks, you are advertising a book. So anything you place there somehow becomes like yeah, part of the advertising. So I was trying to think of something that would be related to a magazine that would be completely like opposite to the marketing area of the magazine. So that's why I came to the idea of a crossword. But I have to tell you that I am normally work with crosswords. I am very inspired by crosswords, and if I am honest, by a particular crossword. So it's not that I am into crosswords in general. Also, a disclaimer, I'm not such a good person for crosswords. I never was. So it takes me a while to understand what they refer to, and then I really try to follow the logics, but I cannot find the words. But this became like a gift. You know, in 2015, for, in 2014, I was like in a, an art residency in the Netherlands, in the south of the Netherlands. I had a lot of time, I had resources, I just needed to focus in what I was doing in my projects. And one day, I went to the paper trash, I was looking for things, anything, and I found a crossword, a quick crossword, in the, the Guardian newspaper, that had some hints, you know, like hints in the crosswords. They say something, and with these hints, you are supposed to find something else. So, for example, I found a crossword that day, the crossword number 13,692, a quick crossword, 
And for example, the hint 18 was large edible fish. I was large edible fish. Large edible fish. I had four spots for letters. I was like, oh yeah, large edible fish. A salmon? No. Tuna. Yeah, that, that's easy. Tuna, yeah, it fits. Might be. But then there was another hint, number 16, larger than life. Larger than life? An ambulance is... Yeah, I hope this person survives. Like, uh, it's capable of being larger than life. Then there was like this hint, na number 9, without additions or modifications. What is without additions or modifications? Hit number three down, not doing much. I love that. <laughs> but what is that? Hit number four, man horses. And I was amazed, like, who is writing these things? Like, number 17, milk container. And I started to see somehow, like, as, I know it's kind of silly, but I started seeing it as poetry in a way. This for me was very nice, like, kind of, like, uh, index. It, it really felt like a poetic number 12. Stern area of a naval vessel reserved for officers. It might have been that this was the first time that I was starting to work a lot and talk in English for my art practice. So maybe I had something with the, with the language. But I didn't know what was a stern area. I had to look stern, okay, to stern, stern a boat. Stern area of a naval vessel. Okay, naval vessel. Reserved for officers. What's that? Like the stern area reserved for the officers of a naval vessel. Okay, yeah, I was thinking. And then but I still didn't know the answers, but it, this like motor of looking for something was what interested me. So I started to do like a I thought it was perfect for doing like an, a machine for making books. So, for example, it is the number 18, large edible fish, tuna. That was my answer. Now, there is something. I erase the need of having like the letter. Those I erase. I just use them as titles. So, for example, yeah. maybe it's okay. Okay, the number 17 was milk container. Okay. I look for a yeah, sketch of a milk container, simple design. Number 11, spraying device. That was kind of abstract for me. I thought of this. I found, had this amazing Peruvian photographer that made these photos of clouds. And I thought, oh yeah, you could think of them as spraying devices. They are spraying water. And I continue, like just playing around. Seven, as number seven was. <coughs> Scally Ant Eater. I look for a Scally Ant Eater in a book. Number six, open. I just opened one little box that I had brought with me from Chile, and I had like a collection of little papers. I just open it. So sometimes you see the hint was just an instruction to do something. And for me, it was just a trigger to find something, to do something. It could become, for example, yeah, as I told you, the number nine was nice. Without additions or modifications. Yeah, that answer with nothing. So this was a simple way that I found to just do like this uh, publications. So yeah, I, I want to be very quick with this because they are quick crosswords, so they are not supposed to be so long. But they, there was, for example, number four. Look, this is another book. I realized that I could use the same technique again for doing it again. <laughs> but this was the same crossword. I used the same hints, but now I was looking again for other answers. So there was the, num the hint number four, man horses. I, look, I googled man horses, and there was this amazing image. I don't know if you know this person. This is a Lakota chief that was known by the people who came to the United States, the colonizers. 
They called him the man who is afraid of his horses. But it was not because he was afraid of his horses, but it was the man, the white man, is afraid of his horses. Because he, it is said that this Lakota chief had a very huge spiritual power that actually translated in political power. So when this Lakota chief was against like a certain like force or a certain like a group of people, like all the Lakota went against them. So this was a perfect answer for man horses. It was given to me. I realized that I could continue this game forever. So I started to work with different publishers and just trying out the same hints. Outdoor pub area. But for this one, that it was already a quick crossword number 13,692, version 4, I decided to use Google. So I would use the text, the normal search, and the text was what I found in the 10th search. It was just the description of the website. And the image was one image that I selected looking for the word. So for example, this hint was outdoor pub area. And you had this image. And the text said, this place is not technically a pub, but it warrants inclusion on this list of summer drinking dens because of its superb outdoor area. Let's go to some that maybe you might know. OK, maybe this one you don't know, but still. Step up the ladder. This was one of the images from the Google search. And the 10th text said, how best to motivate employees and organizations to work together? Step up the ladder. OK, this game continues. So for example, there was a seventh version in which I also used Google, but this time the reverse search image engine, reverse image search engine. So I just like use different, the same hints that I always used and pass them through this Google search. So, okay, if you want, this was a very like a method to open myself to different contents. And it happened that in 2016, I was invited to do a residency and art exhibition in a place called Lugar a Dudas. That is a yeah, residency place and exhibition space in Cali, in Colombia. And they wanted me to do something with their library. Maybe I should say that I like to work with the idea of an archive or a library or a museum, because I think that there are many yeah, interesting things about these institutions. We will talk more about it. But I also like to think of how to see them in a different way, how to open them, how to unfold the information that they hold. So many times, like a library, a museum, uh, an archive is about exclusion. When you decide that you will come in, it means that you cannot come in, and you will also stay away. So many times these institutions are built with many exclusionary decisions. This is not something completely wrong, like they also allowed us to see something. If we would have all the books of the world in the library of Cask, maybe we would be completely lost. But I like this idea of unfolding, opening the library, opening the museum opening the archive. So I proposed them, they wanted me to do something with their library, and I proposed them to use the quick crosswords to like organize their library. The first thing that they told me is that they didn't have any organization in their library. All the books were arranged through how they came to their library. So the first book was the number one, the 46th book was the number 46. So I said, why don't we build some categories? I'm a little bit against categories, but this time I thought they don't have any category. <laughs> Why don't we try something? And I proposed them to use the same quick crossword. So for example, larger than life, that was the hint that you saw, was going to become a category. So the idea was to fit all the books that had to do in some way with larger than life in this new category. 
Of course, it, this was a very utopian proposal because it demanded a long time to read all the books and think if they fit or not the category. But I, yeah, I just started. And for example, I found The Man Who Disappeared, Libro por Clasificar, in the white section, because they still had sections in terms that they still make some difference between artist book, monologues, and exhibition catalogs. They also had philosophy and books that were not art books. And they had a fifth that was uh, books by artists in Colombia. So this was one of the white section, and it was a book that talked, somehow made an homage to Kafka, and there was a character that, because of losing its passport, started to disappear. And then people didn't see him or her as a human anymore. And I thought, yeah, maybe it has to do larger than life. I can connect that book to this category. There was another book, Observaciones a la Rama Dorada de Fraser, de Ludwig Wittgenstein. And in this book, but not in all the book, but particularly in the page number 90, so this was the book 88 of the collection, and in the page 90, there was a whole story about witches and magicians, witchcraft, that were burned in the medieval times in Europe, maybe also in Belgium and in Ghent. And they said that before killing and murdering these people, it was believed that the hair was like a strong source of power for witches and for magicians. So what they would do before like putting them in on fire or hanging them was to like take out all the hair of their of their heads and sometimes even of the of the body in order to uh, they, in order so they could lose their powers, because like people who were murdering were a little bit afraid, of course. And like this page 88 describes how much when they didn't do this, these spirits would come back. They would be larger than life. So yeah, this was a very, if you want, a very uh, time-demanding process to go through the whole library and select all the different things. But why I'm telling you this, this is all a prologue for something else, so don't get bored. But I want to show you just one example. Ah, uh, it's here. So you understand it better. So we have milk container. You saw that it was the number 17. And I was thinking, what could be a milk container in this library? What book could be related to it? And then I, I found a book called Guerra y Paz, that in the page 116 and the page 118, so from the 16th un until the 18th, had a story. And by chance, I have the book here with me, because finding this book allowed me to meet the editor of the book. And in the page 100 and, let's see, 17th and 16th, that is this, there was a conversation between the editor of the book, that is called Sebastián López, and Oscar Muñoz, that is one Colombian artist from Cali, the place where I was doing the game. And they would talk about how this place called Lugar a Dudas, this art space, was somehow like very nourishing almost like food for the city. Because you know in Cali there are not many art spaces, almost none. So this was the only art library in a huge city with millions of people. And they would say how much like the artists, this was a communal somehow art space made by many, not made just by a few. And they would talk how much they would feed and they would almost drink as if it would be very nourishing milk. And I thought, wow, yeah, it's perfect for milk container. This is the book for milk container. Every connection that I did has a story. But the story that gathers us today has to do with this. The hint number six, uh, 12. So if I am not wrong, it's the 12 across, because there is also a 12 down. Stern area of a naval vessel reserved for officers. 
I thought, what can I relate to that? <laughs> it's so complex. Like, I thought, yeah, well, for sure there must be some artists that have worked with boats and ships and, yeah, battles, war, like naval war. But I couldn't find any. So I was looking and looking and looking, I couldn't find any. And I was very frustrated with this hint. And then I thought, yeah, there must be something. What if I change my logic? So a stern area of the naval vessel reserved for the officers. What if I take it a little bit more allegorical, more like a metaphorical? What if this is not a war, but this ship is like maybe the art ship? Maybe what if we think of the art as the ship? So who would be the officers of this ship? Like if the boat is cask, who would be the officers in cask? Who would be the officers that are sterning the, the naval vessel? Who is like driving this ship? So then I thought, okay, let's do this game. What if this is an art library? So who could I find that is like somehow sterning this art library? And then I thought, yeah, let's make it very modern. Let's make it very classical. So I thought of the, ninth, of the 20th century, and there was this book, Art Since 1900, Modernity, Postmodernity, Anti-Modernity, that for sure you have seen. It's this very big book. It's probably in the library here at Kask. It's in every library, in every art school, at least in, yeah, in Europe, for sure. That was written by Hal Foster, Rosalind Krauss, Yves Alain Bois, Benjamin Buchloch, is perfect. They are my officers. They were the officers for the art world for many decades, so probably they still have some influence. I think they are good, good match as officers. And then I thought, this book is the proper one for this hint. But then I start to read the book. <laughs> and then in the page 400... Sorry, 273... No, 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 I'm right. 459, there was a blurry image of a hat. And I don't know why I like really spot on it. And I start to read, it was just a hat with some things inside. And I start to read and it told a story about Robert Filiou. Ah, I know Robert Filiou, yeah, this French artist from the Fluxus, yeah, I know. And then they talk how Robert Filiou in the year 62 and 63 started a gallery inside a hat. So he decided, because he wanted to do a gallery, because he didn't have money, he had to come back to Paris, he needed to do something. He said, I will start a, a gallery. I will sell the works of my friends. He wanted to have a chariot, like a little trolley, and the French authorities said, no, 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 you, that's not considered a gallery. That's illegitimate. Illegitimate gallery, they said to him, with a stamp. And he really wanted to do it, so he said, yeah, fuck off, I will do it in my hat. So it is said, that Robert Filiou came, like, asked different friends, like he asked his friends uh, Jan Tingeli, Niki de Sanfal, Daniel Spurri, to give him works that would be small enough or immaterial so he can put him in his cup. And he would walk down the street and he would take the hat off and he would show these works. All these stories was contained in one page of this big book. I thought, it's perfect for the stern area of a naval vessel reserved for officers, because, yeah, it's like, if I do the analogy, like, what would be the sterning organ of this body? Of course, we all think of the brain as the sterning organ of our bodies. Even though nowadays we know that this is not completely true, like the stomach plays a huge role in how we articulate our bodies. And all the enzymes are sending signals, like, bottom up, that are changing actually how we think. But it's normally conceived, if you agree, that the head and the brain is what somehow controls this body. So who are the officers of this body? It's the head. So I thought, yeah, it's perfect. He's doing something with his head. I think it works perfectly. And then what happens is that I start to read back and they say, yeah, he did something very interesting because he matched the art space with the mental space. So yeah, for me, it matched perfect with this hint. It came here, it became a hint, game solved, puzzle done. And I continued. And you know, this game like, was open, so people could... I explained the game and people could play their own game, they could follow my logics, or found their own logics, their own logics, because anyone can make any association. For me, it's not about what I think, but it's also more for triggering the association. But these stories stick to me. And after one year, more or less, 
I was invited to uh, an exhibition in Belgrade in a gallery called U10, and the exhibition was called Chinese Whispers. You know, like this game that you say something, you whisper something to someone, and then this person whisper what it hear to somebody else, and then you whisper and you continue, and then what comes out is something completely different from the beginning. So this exhibition was based on this game. In another culture, it's known with another names. In Chile, we know it as the broken telephone, or the telephone, or the, in German, they call it Stille Post. Or, yeah, it's, it has different names, but basically it's the same. So I decided that I wanted to work with this story, but I wanted to change it a little. So I want to do a reenactment of this gallery in a hat, but differently. So I didn't tell you exactly how it worked for Robert Filiou because it was not certain. What is known is that Robert Filiou came to his friends and he said, Nikki, would you give me one piece for the gallery? I promise to sell it. I will just take the 33% of the piece that you give me. And uh, please do it because Jan already did and Daniel is already making something great. It will be so great. So you need to please give me something. Then he went to Jan. And he said, Jan, Nikki already is working on her work. Why don't you give me something for the gallery in the hat? I think it will be great. And then I can sell it, and I will charge the 33%. And in that way, he was convincing all his friends, and it seems that people were giving him things, and he was carrying them, and he would show it to passersby. And it seems that he even sold a few pieces. But then I thought, I don't want to do a gallery. Mine won't be a gallery. It will be in a hat, for sure. But I thought, I want to do a museum. I want to keep the pieces. I don't want to like sell them away. So I wrote to several artist friends, some very close to me and some others a little bit far away that I didn't know so well, and I invite them to contribute with a piece small enough or in material so I can fit it inside my hat. And on the 17th of August of 2017, for the opening of this show, I just was carrying a bowler hat with 19 pieces inside, and I just like told the people, are you interested in art? They were a little bit uh, skeptic. Of course, we're in an opening. What are you thinking? Stupid. Why do you think I'm here? And then I would go to somebody else, like, hey, do you have uh, interested in art? Yeah, sure. It happens that I have a museum. <laughs> and they would be like, what? <laughs> Yeah, I have a museum. I'm carrying it. What? Sorry, I don't understand you. And then he said, yeah, well, it's, it's complex, it's little museum, but if you want to see it... And slowly I start gathering everyone, and I took the hat off, and I showed them the pieces. Today I want to do with you exactly the same. Do you want to see my museum? <laughs> So, yeah, it's like the artworks, I need to be able to carry them. And also, for me, it's very interesting and important that you're able to touch them. So this is completely something that you can touch, feel free. But as I ask you, please take some kind of care. I have to tell you that at this moment, what was supposed to be one-time reenactment that day, I thought of doing it just for that day. Um, immediately after the presentation, there were three artists that came to me. Actually, two that are living in Belgium. And they said, I have something for your museum. The second one said, I also have something for your museum. And the third artist from Belgrade, he said, I have something for your museum, but I need to give it to you now, because if not, you will leave. <laughs> so from that moment, I knew that I had to continue with this and that it somehow was a little bit beyond myself. So I took the responsibility of carrying the pieces. And now the museum has 155 art pieces. I don't carry them all, all the time. Every time I do a different selection of pieces. And there are also eight museum buildings at this, at this moment, in the shape of hats. So now you're seeing the newest building in the institution. This is a novelty. It's a piece that I have never shown before. 
is a piece by Charlotte Marcus. If you want, you can pass it around. You know, through the pieces, I want to tell you a little bit how this museum works. But <coughs> I can say that Charlotte, she works a lot with textile, as you see. And Charlotte, like she has researched for many years about a practice in Japan that is called boro. Somebody knows about boro? You know, in Japan, when there was this big war with China, they didn't have money to buy, like, make clothes. So people couldn't have uh, buy clothes during many years. So what they did is that they kept patches, pieces of clothes, and they would sell them in the market. So you would go and there would be like places full of stacks of little patches. And what they would do is that they would like weave them together and do like clothes made out of patches. So if your cloth was broken, you would go and then you would just buy a patch and you glue it or you, you weave it. They woven it in the most simple way and they dye this clothes with blue. So all the bottles are blue. And the reason was that indigo was the cheapest and it was very easy to get from in Japan because they plant a lot of indigo. So they were, have all these amazing clothes. Now we think that they're amazing. Back then it was the poorest decision, but the simplest. And they all were dressing in blue with many patches. Charlotte is amazed by these boros. And she went to Japan and she explored about these boros. And she like, stayed for four months in a, like, seeing a big collection of boros and learning how to do it and how they did it. And also learning about the dyeing techniques and the weaving techniques. And when I invited her to give something for the museology team, she thought of the boros and how it is made. So she used this very simple way of weaving that she says that is the strongest ways of weaving that you have, more or less, but at the same time, it's very fragile. So sometimes, like you see, if you don't knit or if you don't weave the borders, they are loose. And she thought of, the, of these like, non-images, the black squares, also for, yeah, referring to this image that could be. So she says that it's like an invitation. She wrote a very nice letter to the museum saying, talking about fragility and life. Actually, she did this during the corona times. And yeah, you can see the piece. I have some, also some other novelties that I have never shown. And for me, this is also very nice to show. I have this piece called Gravity. <laughs> it's a piece by Karel Martens. Karel Martens is a graphic designer from the Netherlands. Sometimes I like to point out where people come from, but not because I'm snobbish, but also I want to tell where they are living now. Just to point out that artists move. And as this is a nomadic museum, I also like to point out that there are people who are born in one place and they move to another place, and sometimes to several places because of their work of life. So I will tell sometimes, for example, where people come from and where they are living. For example, Charlotte, she comes from Sweden, but at the moment she's living at, in Amsterdam. Karel Martens I met in the Netherlands, and I don't know if you know the work of Karel Martens, but he's a very well-known graphic designer in the Netherlands, he even started a whole university in Arnhem, Bergplatz Typography. So for the ones that are into graphic design, Karel Martins is a very good recommendation. And when I invited him to the museum, it was very particular because it happens to, that I met Karel in a bus. I was going to the central station in Amsterdam and in front of me was Karel Martens in the stop of the bus station. I was with a bag, that's why I was going by bus. I never take the bus in Amsterdam. And then I say, Karel Martens, yeah, who, who are you? And I say, yeah, I'm Martin. I once went to a talk that you gave. And we start to talk, and then I say, yeah, you know, it happens that I have a museum. You know that normally I don't do like just this kind of formal presentations. So sometimes I also 
Any random day, I wear one of the museum buildings, I take three or four works, and I just put it. And that's the way that I do. It's also, maybe it's nothing happens, there are days that I don't show to anyone. But for me, it's still interesting to, like, yeah, think of the artist, think of the stories. You know, I have to train my skull. There's a lot of weight. So this day, Carl Martin was there, and then we were in the bus, and we don't have, like, so much time from the bus until the last uh, stop. So we had, like, around seven minutes, and I said, yeah, Carl, I have a museum, and I have it with me. Do you want to see it? Yeah, oh, sure, yeah, why not? <laughs> and then I took it. And he was very ex amazed, or I don't know if he looked at me with this face, like, what, who are you, what are you doing? It, I didn't know if he considered me crazy, or if he was very into it. I cannot say. But he saw very tenderly all the pieces, and I passed them by, and he touched them. And then that day, we say goodbye, and he said, have good luck. He was going to Tokyo, and then from Tokyo was traveling to Milan. He was giving like this big talk in Tokyo, and then going to uh, Design Week in Milan. And then I wrote him an email. Hey, uh, Karel, I was thinking, maybe you would like to do something for the Museology team. And he didn't answer. He didn't answer until like one month afterwards. He wrote me this very short message. The work is done. The Baidrache is clear. And then it was this gravity. You know, Carl Martin used to do these monocopies, that in which he takes these very simple like parts, mechanical parts, and he prints them in colors. They are very incredible. Thank you. I want to show you one work that is very... Yeah, I need to show it today. But I have shown it many times, so this is not a novelty. This is a work by a very good friend, Araferri Ahi. I know her for a long time, and we work together a lot, we collaborate, we write together. We have a collective called To See, The Inability to See, with Marty Fleerfoot and Araferri Ahi. And we have this kind of very weird practice of writing the three of us, so we share a lot. And sometimes we don't even realize how much we are sharing. You know, Arafe comes from Tehran, but she lives now in Den Haag. And with this collective, we were supposed to do a trip to Tehran. We were departing on the 14th of October. So I think it was next week or the week after. And yeah, I don't know if you follow the news, but there are many things going on there. So at the moment, Margie is not going, and I, I was not going for like many months already. And it's a little bit paradox, because we write, we write about boundaries, and about going through boundaries. And sadly, we cannot go there. But I want to explain you the work of Arafe. So Arafe has this pencil from school, so she keeps the pencil that she used since she was like a student in school. And I don't know if you know the brand, the German brand of pencil that is called Stettler. The thing is that in Iran there are also Stettler pencils, and Arafe told me, I cannot reproduce it exactly, my accent is not good, but in Farsi there is a word very similar to Stettler that is like Stettlerish. Somebody speaks Farsi here? Yeah, I can uh, double check if you have interest, but it's like Stettlerish. And Stedlerisch means to reason. So in the Farsi version of Stedler, Arafe wrote Stedlerisch. She, completely, she completed the name of the brand. And she transformed it into reason, reasoning, the act of reason. And that's her pencil. And she invites anyone who wants to reason. She has a story, and if you want, you can write something. That's what she asked me to ask the visitors of this Museology team. So feel free, now or afterwards, to just write something. I will leave it here. This is one of the very few museums that you don't need to necessarily go to visit, but it can also visit you. 
But this is not the only museum in this shape. <laughs> Actually, once I was in the city of, in, the, in Hasselt, in an artist book fair, and some people came to me and they said, hey, you need to meet Ersi Varferi. You need to meet Ersi Varferi. And then somebody else came, hey, you need to meet Ersi Varferi. And I was like, why? And then they said, she also has a museum. <laughs> and I was like, what kind of museum? And they, I, yeah, they brought me to this uh, very nice artist that comes from Athens, but was living in Antwerp. And Ersi Farferi started a museum in her sweater. <laughs> so uh, Ersi invites different artists if they could uh, do some kind of graphic that they embed in her sweater. <sighs> of course, it was like friendship on the first second. And yeah, we still have a promise of a... Uh, like, she wants to do something for one of the museum buildings of the Museology team. She actually wants to invite her partner, that is also an artist, to do some kind of graphic that she can embed, weave, embroidered in the, into the museum building. But as a sign of, of her promise, she gave me one of her publications <laughs> that is called Today. It's an edition of one copy. And this publication is very, yeah, she thought it was perfect for the Museology team. <coughs> Somehow also relates to what I face. <laughs> you can see it around. Inside the Cifar Ferry, I also keep this work. But this I might show you afterwards, because I need to connect with something else. But I can tell you about a work that I am carrying now in my head. Maybe you have seen it. But actually this, like braiding of my hair, I normally have a braid, and I cut my hair. So in Amsterdam, I go to cut my hair with a hairdresser that is called Monsieur Aliou, or that's his artist name. And Monsieur Aliou is a very great uh, hairdresser. I have followed him since its beginning because I went to, I don't know, just by chance I started cutting my hair in a hairdresser in Amsterdam. And I have many stories with her, but maybe, yeah, I also need to show other work, so I won't tell them. But I have something with her. For me, hair is important. And he started working for another hairdresser. But I noticed immediately that he was very interesting and nice talk, but also a very good hairdresser. I love how he, like, the time that he used. And you know, since I use a bride, I spend a lot of time braiding my hair every day. So sometimes it takes me around seven minutes to braid my hair. So I'm also, if I go to a hairdresser, I want that they treat it, like, properly. If I go to a hairdresser and they make this joke, ah, I will cut your bride, immediately I go out. <laughs> So I'm also sensitive. And Ali was not at all like that. He was like, oh, he immediately looked the hair and he said, oh, yeah, you can do this, you can do that. And after, along the, throughout the time, Ali now, he has his own like, uh, hair salon. It's very nice. He designed it completely. And we many times have conversations about the hair, about, yeah, normal hairdressers' conversation. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you into? What are you going to do in the weekend? And sometimes I started to tell him, yeah, I have this museum. It's a museum in a hat. And then, ah, oh, yeah, he was very into it. And then one day he said to me, but Martin, if your museum is in the hat, like the hair is like the, the floor. <laughs> so yeah, or like the carpet. So then I was like, uh, yeah, you're right. And then he was like, yeah, if I do something to your hair, I'm somehow shaping your museum. And I was, yeah, you're completely right, Ali. Like he was completely right. And then he said, yeah, why don't we do something? And he proposed me to, braid my hair and do something with my hair in a way that it would become an artwork of this collection. Of course, I showed him some other works and he knew a little bit about it. And he felt completely free to do something. And I also like it. So today in the morning, I went to Monsieur Liu and he did this special arrangement. He says that his idea would have been to use like color hair extensions. He wanted to use pink and blue. And sometimes we have done it, so we have done the trial. But today he said, no, I will keep it simple because I don't have time and I don't have the hair. But he still wanted to do something special, so he braided in a way, like normally it's a long braid, and today he did this. Okay, do you want to see more pieces? Yeah. 
Okay, I want to show you this one. As part of my art practice, I have engaged sometimes with mental health realm. So, in a nutshell, I have to tell you that in 2019, 18, 19, I spent four months in a psychiatric hospital, living there as an artist. So, yeah, I had some uh, background with mental health because my father is like works in the mental health. He's a doctor. He works as a psychiatrist. So since I was a child, I knew about these stories of mental health. But I never relate to it. I never studied anything that had to do with mental health. For me, it was something that, that you know a little. But if you really ask me, I didn't know anything because I just heard stories. But I never went myself to a psychologist, to a psychiatrist. But I was very well aware what is a therapy. I read about psychiatry, about I read Freud. I, was, I had some interest. There was this kind of interest. But it happened that once in Amsterdam, I was presented to a psychiatrist. He was called Bilko Taunbreyer. And they said to me that he had to do with the arts. And I was starting to speak Dutch at the time, and I told him a story. I said in Dutch, my very rudimentary Dutch, that my father uh, had once a patient that one day came to him and said, Doctor, I want to leave something as a way of saying thanks for this therapy. My father said, yeah, why not? So this person left something. So my father, he had like this private bureau, like a place where he does the therapy, and somebody left this thing. And then there was a second person, a second client, who said, Doctor, what is that? No, well, that's something that left another patient. I also want to leave something, can I? Yeah, sure. So this person... And then there was a third one, and a fourth one, and a fifth one, and a sixth one, and now, like, the therapy room is full, 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 full of things. And it's the most eclectic collection. Don't think it's amazing. It's not like sometimes it's horrible. Sometimes it's beautiful. There are very nice things, but there are very trivial things. There are stones, there are ceramics, there are like very like jewels. There are whatever you can imagine is there. And I grew up seeing this collection, but I never knew what they were. You know, the psychiatrists are not allowed to tell the stories of their patients or like what happens in therapy is supposed to stay in therapy. So I was witness to all these objects that had many stories, but I didn't know what were they about. And I was telling this story to this doctor in Amsterdam, and he asked me, Martin, and how does this relate to your art practice? And I said, sorry, I never thought about it. I felt very bad. I never had made that question. It's like a blind spot. Of course, it has a lot to do. I work with objects, I tell the stories, yeah. But I never thought about it. And he said to me, yeah, I think you need to go deeper into that. You know, I, ha I am the director of an organization called Beautiful Distress, he told me. And we try to bring artists into the realm of mental health. But not pushy. We just want to invite artists to live experiences in a mental health context, like a hospital, explore with people, work, like see if something happens. And that's how I lived for four months in the Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn after that conversation. And it was a very interesting time because, of course, we all deal with, all have some mental health issues. Like one in fourth persons in the whole planet will at one point in their life have to go to a professional in the mental health asking for help. And the other three for sure will experience anxiety, will experience depression. There will be moments that are tough. We all have our mental health. There is nothing like kind of crazy or sane. That's completely a construction. Of course, we could talk a lot about it. But yeah, like it was super interesting to work inside this hospital and live there because you start to break many ideas and fantasies and also stereotypical ideas that you have about mental health. And part of this process was that I met Toshiko Kobayashi. Toshiko Kobayashi introduced herself as an origami therapist. And I was like, what is that? What is origami therapy? Please take it. And she said, yeah, I do origami. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, um, I, 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 
I fold paper, but I don't know if you can call it origami. And she said, of course that's origami. Everything that you do with paper is origami. If you fold it, if you cut ah, but sometimes I cut it with a scissor. And she said, yeah, that's, that's also origami. It doesn't matter. There are no rules for origami. I want to show you something just because like, I received a visit from Toshiko not so long ago. And back then I said to Toshiko, after some weeks, I just drew in a paper like, uh, like the hospital where we were working. And I said to Toshiko, Toshiko, this is my interpretation of your origami therapy. And she said, yeah, you really got origami. <laughs> I just like fold uh, A4 and did like a little cutting and did some drawings. And Toshiko said, you know, for some people, but I say, but how does it work? And she said, yeah, for some people, they don't want to say anything. They don't want to talk. There are some people that they lo don't like to think about it. They just like to do. But there are others who like to talk a lot. So yeah, origami also helps with that. Sometimes it's good to do something. So then my whole museum started also to be somehow nurtured by these experiences in this hospital realm, but also in the realm of mental health. So sometimes these little actions, little things that you carry, little things that you fold, also become a way of building your own space, of building your own narrative. For Toshiko, it's all about building your own narrative. You know, in psychoanalysis, they say <coughs> you are able to regain your narrative. You somehow can bring it back to you, or you can understand what is happening to you. And I started to think from an art side, I'm not therapist, I don't engage in therapy, but I started to see, yeah, there is some sense in terms that when you tell a story, you also make it your own. I am also showing you Toshiko because I want to go to some other aspect of the museum. <coughs> So there is something. Simon today told me, yeah, you're going beyond the museum, the hat. It's not anymore a hat museum. And I have to say that for some artists, this is small. I say that it has to be small enough to fit in the hat. But for some others, like this is quite small. Or there are these materials that are heavy or that they are like, like they could harm my skull. So it, it was always a problem sometimes with some works. If I wear them in my head, they become problematic for my body. It's very concrete, it's not theoretical. And so I decided that I would also allow myself to have garden installations or outside sculptures. And these would be pieces that I won't carry inside the hut, but I will carry in my pockets. So there is like the gardens of the museum. Ah, I, and I want to show you, this is also one of the, the latest, latest pieces in the collection. And it's very related to the previous one. And it's a piece by Tatsuo. Tatsuo Yoshida. This is Tatsuo's passport. You know Tatsuo, how did he came to the how did he come to the Musée Legitime? Because of his mother, Toshiko. So the story <coughs> is very simple. <coughs> Toshiko was traveling to Europe. And Toshiko was giving a, lec a lecture about origami in Perugia in Italy. And then she wanted to visit me in the Netherlands. Toshiko lives in New York. <clears throat> but six, five years ago or six years ago, Toshiko had a, a stroke in her brain. And she lost a little bit of mobility, but Toshiko is okay. But she still needed that her son, Tatsuo, would drive her through the trip. You know, Tatsuo booked a flight from Tokyo to New York, and he went through India, New Delhi. And in the airport in New Delhi, they say, what is this? Tatsuo made some drawings. Toshiko always saying, my son is crazy. He was also doing some, putting some stamps. <laughs> you know, she said, Tatsuo loves to do drawings and crazy stuff. He also burned his passport. And he was making drawings out of the burned passport. And the officer in New Delhi said, this is not a legal document, you cannot go on. 
And a little bit of Kafka stories, that Suo saw himself in New Delhi, he didn't have a valid passport, they void it. They put like these little holes that say void. And that Suo couldn't come back to Tokyo. Because he didn't have a passport, he couldn't continue to New York. So for two days, Tatsuo was completely lost in the middle of the airport in New Delhi. And without any answer. So he couldn't do anything. He still said that Indian authorities were quite nice. They gave him food, they were super like nice. But for two days, he didn't have any nationality. He was a non-person. After these two days, the like Jap Japanese embassy allowed him to give a permit in order for him to come back to Tokyo. He came back and he had to wait five days to then go to New York to pick Toshiko, and then they were able to do the trip. You can imagine how much money it costs for Tatsuo. Tatsuo doesn't earn so much money. He works like in this very like day-to-day -day works. And then it was a huge bah, like wait. Tatsuo felt very ashamed. And Toshiko would say, Tatsuo, tell, tell, tell why we are delayed. Tell why we are five days later here. Tell, tell everyone, tell, tell what did you do to your passport? And then Tatsuo was a little bit ashamed and he would show it. And then when they went to my studio, Tatsuo finally said, Martin, I have an idea. I love your museum, I like it a lot. And I would be so honored to have something of myself in your museum. And I was thinking, would you receive this passport as an artwork? I know you have very interesting artists in the museum, but would you consider me an artist? And I say, Tatsuo, it's all about that. That's my museum, what it's about. And he said, yeah, I think that it would be very nice because it would be a way of like transcending the experience. And for Toshiko, it would be also nice because she is also so mad about this experience. And I say, I love it, Tatsuo, please give it to the collection. So that's the latest work in the collection of the museum. I want to show you also another outside installation, or in this case, garden sculpture. It's by an artist called Sebastián Calfuqueo. They like to work with many things related to their identity. So Sebastián Calfuqueo, I remember when I read the first articles about their work in the newspapers, they would say, homosexual, mapuche, Mapuche are indigenous people from the south of Chile. So homosexual, Mapuche artist is presenting a work. I thought, wow, they are very like categorical. Homosexual, Mapuche artist is doing a presentation, blah, blah, blah. So Sebastián Calfuqueo uh, was coming from this tradition of the, he, oh, sorry, they uh, come from this tradition of the Mapuches. So Sebastián was born from a Mapuche family because you know in, the, in Chile and particularly in the south there are many people that are mestizos. So you don't know exactly if you are indigenous or not, but you guess. But there are some others that are, they know that they're indigenous because of their last name, because of their family, because they speak the old uh, indigenous words and language. And in this case, Sebastián, since uh, they were very young, they would uh, embody the Mapuche. And this is not something trivial, because in the older times, like 20 years ago, 40 years ago, Mapuche people were super discriminated in Chile. So even though almost all we were Mapuches, we all acted as we were not Mapuches. So yeah, for the mestizos or for people that have a European roots, it's easier. But if you have like a skin in the color of Mapuches and you have a last name, it was very harsh because you were not given a job, you were excluded from education. It was somehow complex, as it happened to many indigenous people all over the planet. But the thing is that Sebastián is from a generation that they are claiming back their Mapuches roots. So Sebastián says, we are Mapuches. But also Sebastián had like, like this kind of category that was imposed, but he also claimed back being homosexual. So nowadays, uh, Sebastián is non-binary, Sebastián is also part of a big queer community, but also Mapuches. So I remember one of the first works that I saw of Sebastián, that was this very interesting video in, in which they would put like these clothes, very like ancient uh, shaman from the Mapuches people, and he would, like they would claim, I would never be a Weye. And Weye 
were these shamans that before the Spanish came to the south of the Amer of the South America, like they would be transgender people. They would be the healers of the community. Maybe not in those terms, they would call them the two spirits. That's how the Mapuches called like people who were like in between genders and they had a very important role because they were healers and they were also like leading many ceremonies. But after the Spanish came, this was completely cut. No more of that. And the weyes became just male figures. Or there was the machi that was a female figure. And they were very strong in this. But this did, wasn't a Mapuche tradition, but it became somehow a Mapuche tradition. And Sebastián dedicated this video to their grandmother, and they say, I would never be a Weye, even though I was originally the Weye, maybe. Maybe if I would have been born 500 years ago, I would have been a Weye. For the Museology team, and this is one of the very first times that I show this work, uh, Sebastián gave this little figure that is a souvenir. And it's a souvenir that they made in the south of Chile. And yeah, it's full of many complexities because you see this machi, the female figure of the healers, with a shield that is actually not a shield, it's an instrument, it's like a drum for healing, and it reads Chile. So they sell it as a souvenir of Chile, of the Mapuche's people. And there's a big fight for the land and for the who owns the land. And it's also a souvenir. And somehow when they gave it to me, I thought, yeah, it's interesting because it reminds me immediately of this huge headline. Homosexual, Mapuche, artist. And sometimes they use that and they laugh about it because it's also, yeah, they are also quite tender. So they don't want, they want to have a very political stance about it. But they also realize that there is also a power of taking those words back, regaining your story. Do you have interest in more works? I have many. I want to show you a work by Ellen Yu that actually is very nice to me. You know, Ellen Yu is an artist who was studying this uh, in the art school, in the art academy in Den Haag, the KABK. And one day she contacted me because she was writing a thesis about yeah, art in small scales or art in special spaces. She was researching, of course, the Boat and Balise de Duchamp. She had interest for this story of Duchamp and uh, his friend that was a doll housemaker, and that she invited Marcel Duchamp to do a little artwork. And there are some people that say that that's how it started all this idea of doing miniature works. She was also researching about uh, certain um, art galleries inside a like small spaces in a trolley. She was also researching about different experiences in art history. And she came to the museology team and she wanted to write about it. And I, of course, I invited her and we <coughs> have several conversations about scale, about what's the possibility for uh, some kind of in the independent art space in the arts. And she wrote this thesis in such a way that it became the smallest thesis in the history of the Netherlands but not in terms of extension of words, but in terms of the published material. She did this very, very, very little thesis that you can see there. You can access also it online. So it's actually, it has an average size of like quantity of words, but still she made it very small. And <coughs> following the idea of Simon that I am sometimes extending a little bit far away from the hut. It's not that I want to open a museum in a bag, don't think about that. But actually, I will tell you more about this bag later. But this is more like, let's see it as storage space. Since today is a lecture, I allow myself to tell you a little bit more of the genesis or how this So this, that is the museum building number seven, was a proposal by Ellen Yu 
the same that wrote the thesis for the museum in the hut. So Ellen, she also works sometimes with textile, and she's quite handy. She does very interesting stuff. She said, why not to propose a building instead of an artwork? I want to contribute with infrastructure to this institution. And I say, yeah, sure. You know, <laughs> Ellen is quite special. At the moment, she is in Hong Kong, where she's from, but she sometimes comes to the Netherlands. So when she comes, we meet. And she proposed this hut, or museum building. You can see she proposed all these little pockets. And I still have like a conversation to have with Ellen, because I need to tell you that this was a little bit complex to me. In terms that I love it, the first time that I saw I got in love with it, but it resulted not so good for the Museum Legitim. And I want to explain you why. So first, the museum became so interesting and flamboyant that when I used it the first time, I came into a room and everyone <laughs> looked at me. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes I use hats, but yeah, other people also wear hats. But this was a particular hat. So then they were all looking at me and, yeah, it lost this kind of magic that I was going to do something without them knowing. So what happened to me is that it became such a costumey hat that I couldn't use it because everyone was more into the hat than in what I, what I was going to show. And the second reason why it didn't work completely well for the Museum Legitim is that it had so many pockets that I put the pieces inside and I forgot them. <laughs> and then I start to lose them because they would be like I would be spend like many minutes looking through the pockets. So then I realized that actually the best way of you wearing a hat is just I put the things inside. And then I just, with the space of my head, I have a big head, I just do like this. And it's the best. So many people say, yeah, it's interesting, because a designer would think, yeah, if you have pockets, I would do this and that. But then, yeah, it didn't work. So I still need a conversation with Ellen. Maybe we come up with another prototype. But I still think of it as very interesting, yeah, kind of proposal. So I wanted to show it to you. There is something else that I want to show you. And this is also just for cask lacing, lacing and because I don't do it normally that I bring the other museum hats. There are a few presentations in which I have shown all the museum buildings. But in a presentation more like live, I don't do this. So this is quite unique. And, but I do it still because it's very fresh work and I wanted to try it out. So there is this artist, Francisca Sanchez. She's a great sculptor, lives in Santiago. And when I invited her to do something for the Museo Legitim, she said that she wanted to do a site-specific work for the bowler hat. This was the first museum building that I was wearing in Belgrade. And Francisca said, you know, I want to do a piece that you can explain speculate a little bit about space and maybe you can make a drawing like a ship or maybe you can ask someone to do something She said to me that it reminded her a little bit also of these uh, doodles that you like, you know, when you are like just doing like drawings without thinking about it. Can somebody tell me what time it is? Do you want to hear a special story? I have like many more pieces, but maybe there are a few that I need to show. I think I will just do.
But I will... Oh. I don't want it to make it so long because you will forget all the names and all the artists that I'm showing you. But there's still like a few that I promise I will show their work. Sorry that today many of the artists are coming from Chile, but I come from there, so <laughs> sometimes I feel like responsibility. You know, there is this artist called Vicente Baeza. He's at the moment living in Amsterdam. He's doing an art residency called The Ateliers. That is like two years long residency. But since they had many problems for the COVID and the director renounced and then all the like different artists that were like tutors, they also quit. It, there was a mess. They extended their stay. So now they're staying for almost like three years. So he has been for a long time in this art institution, like with his huge uh, studio and doing many interesting things. And I have had time to meet him and talk more. And you know, he said to me that he always uh, went to a dentist in Santiago. And he really told me that actually he felt a little bit embarrassed, but he said that his father would take care of it. So he never wanted to go to the dentist, but his father would say to, hey, Vicente, have you been to the dentist? Like, how is your going with your dental health? And he would then take an hour. So he wouldn't take kind of care of his dental health. And he said once in a time he had a cavity and they would fix it and so on. And during this whole stay in Amsterdam, he didn't go to the dentist not even once. And he said, no, maybe I will have something, I don't know. And then one day he started to have some kind of pain in his, uh, how do you call it, the molar, the ones that the, the wisdom tooth. He started to have pain in the wisdom tooth. He didn't know back then, but he had some pain. And then he said, yeah, maybe I need to go to the doctor, but yeah, I, I won't do it. And then he didn't go to the dentist until it was very harsh pain, so he had to go for urgency. If you mind. The thing is that the dentist had to take out the wisdom tooth. Luckily, it was a wisdom tooth, because then you have to take it out sometimes. But it has a huge cavity that had like made a huge hole in all the tooth. Vicente was working, funnily enough, with some images of his teeth. Because, you know, in Chile he had this treatment, sorry, to have these um, brackets. How do you call them? The treatment that they put you, these metal things to... Braces. So he had braces. And he was telling how like he had these braces and it was a very painful process during his whole teenage time. So he was very used to go to the dentist. And these are photos that the dentist gave to him that they had to do for his process. And he was working with them. So he had these huge <coughs> paintings or things in his studio and he puts these little spots of his dental treatment from previous years. And Vicente said that during this whole time of working in this art residency, he was somehow working, maybe with the help of other beings, in his wisdom tooth. So he started to consider, and he said to me, I want to consider like this cavity as part of my work or maybe of my not doing much. And I want to also show like these little cavities. Sorry, the little process of the braces. That's Vicente. I thought it was very matching for the anatomical theater. But okay, I don't know if you know this work. It's a little Buddha sculpture. Have you seen it before? You know that this work comes from a very special artist that maybe is also this one of the stories also that I wanted to tell you, and I don't want to prolong it forever, but this story is special to me. Because this is a work that was given to this museum by Daniel Spurri. Daniel Spurri, does somebody know Daniel Spurri? Is this artist coming from Bulgaria that is still alive? He's like, was associated with the Fluxus movement. 
and he resulted to be one of the very fair, uh, best friends of Robert Philippe, this other French guy who did the gallery in a hat. It's not that I am obsessed with these male figures in the art world, they just came to me. But this Daniel Spuri was the only one that wrote very thoroughly and very interestingly about the Galerie Legitime. So it's even not academic or not really serious about art, it's actually more about friendship, you know? All the books that would tell about the work of Robert Philippe would say exactly the same. They would even sometimes copy-paste what it was said about this Galerie Legitime. They didn't have any idea of what it was, or they have roughly an idea. The thing is that Daniel Spuri, when I was looking about this gallery, I wanted to know more about the reenactment that I was doing. Daniel Spuri wrote a very interesting text about his friend Robert and how he came with the Galerie Legitime. And he wrote the anecdotes and he wrote about the things that I'm telling to you, how he invited people and so on. And I thought, in my ignorance, that he was dead. Because I calculated in 2018, he was 88. He probably was dead. Or, yeah, the thing is that one day visiting a friend, Stephanie, in Paris, she was working in a gallery and there was an envelope that was signed, Daniel Spuri. And by chance I look this and I say, why do you have an envelope by Daniel Spuri? And they say, yeah, we work with him. Is he alive? Yeah, sure, he lives in Vienna. And I was like, I need to ask, I need to talk to Daniel Spuri, I need to know what this gallery was, I need to know exactly what it was. And the thing is that I start to ask different people, do you know how can we contact Daniel Spuri? I wrote to the assistant, it was very difficult, no answers. It was kind of tough. But I have a friend, Astrid, and Astrid is a graphic designer and sound artist, amazing sound artist, and she lives in Vienna. And I said, Astrid, do you think that we can contact this uh, Daniel Spurri? And she said, yeah, Martin, I think it's tough. These Fluxus people, they are old, they are grumpy. They don't like that artists are redoing what they did. They consider that bullshit. No, I think no way. No, it won't work. But still, she was very, even though she was very pessimist, and I was a little bit, oh, yeah, well, that's it. She still asked many friends. Do you know Danis Puri? Do you know Danis Puri? Have you met Danis Puri? And there was a very good friend of her, a curator, who resulted to be working with Danis Puri. Astrid called me one Friday and said, Martin, you need to come to Vienna. On Tuesday, we have a dinner with Daniel Spurri. I was like, I cannot go because, come, like, you need to come. <laughs> so I yeah, arranged everything, it was very tough, it was difficult. Okay, we traveled to Vienna and we went there to a dinner, invited by a Swiss artist to have a dinner with Daniel Spurri. There were 12 people in the evening. We were outside the apartment. I was wearing the Musée Legitime, the Coppola hat, the second museum building. We were Astrid and Thomas, Astrid partner, he's also an artist, and Thomas said, hey, let's be prepared for frustration as well. Sometimes also things could go wrong, and that's okay. Let's take this as a learning process. And I, yeah, okay, yeah, it's true. <laughs> Maybe we not, not need to be excited. Maybe you don't understand the excitement, but this was a person who knew about this gallery, so I was like very into it. So we went in, we were presented. I was presented. This is Martin Laroche, like he does a museum in a hat, like uh, following or after a reenactment, but very particular of Robert Philippe. And then Daniel said, Ah, my friend Robert, yeah. He wasn't serious about it. And I was, What? Yeah, he was not serious about it, and he must have seen my face because I thought many, many, many things in one second, like maybe he wasn't serious about it, so I'm doing something that is kind of a joke, but I take it too serious, maybe I'm kind of dumb, but then, but maybe it's interesting because I'm, I, and then he said, no, 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 you don't get it. Like he was very, very, he didn't care about the things he did, but in a very good way. He wasn't serious in a, that was what made it so amazing, Robert Philip, he said. He just did what he wanted. If he had an idea, he materialized it. He made it somehow. It didn't matter if it was well done, incredibly done, very bad done, or if it was just an idea. For him, that was, that was his charm, he said. And I was like, wow. And I said, like, I asked him, do you remember the work that you gave him for the Galerie Legitime in the hat? And he was like, oof, this happened like 50 years ago. No, I don't remember. And I was like, but how come? And, but do you remember the other words, what uh, Nikki de Sanfal gave? No, no, I don't remember. 
And I was like, but, but how come do you not, don't remember? And he was like, Martin, in 50 more years you won't remember anything <laughs> unless you write it down. And he looked at me and Astrid, and we were thinking of starting to write down these stories that I'm carrying and how to write them down. Sometimes I resist because I don't want to control them. I don't want to fix them. I don't want that they become the thing. I still respect the artist and I try to transmit their message. But many times in every presentation, even showing the same piece, I put a different emphasis. So I discovered that if I show all the time the same pieces, I can also become very mechanic and I can start to tell the same thing again and again and again. And I don't want to. There are also some things that I allow myself to come in the moment or there are some emphasis of some piece or some other. So we were dealing with all these things. And it was very amazing. So I felt, yeah, yeah, I, I'm already paid. We already, this is amazing. It was the best answer that we could have. Thank you a lot, Mr. Daniel Spurry. And then we were invited for dinner. We had our very nice evening. They served us some wine. By chance, I was like seated next to Daniel Spurry. I told him, you know, my brother is also called da Daniel. <laughs> like we talk about many different things, but nothing very that I could remember. And then during the dessert, I said, Daniel, do you want to see my museum? I was very timid. I left the museum in the entrance. It was a Swiss dinner. And I felt, yeah, to eat with a hat, like I, it will be weird. I don't know, they were formal. But I still had it there. So then I said, do you want to see my museum? He said, yeah, sure, bring it. So I brought the museum, and then I started to do exactly what we have been doing today. And then he was like a kid, like, ah, and then he was like taking out everything, very disorganized, not like, not one by one. Luckily, there was a curator in front of me who said, ah, but what is this? And then I could tell a little bit, oh, yeah, this is from somebody, this is from somebody. And then at one point, um, the owner of the home, like started to see that there was something going on on the other side of the table and then all people started to come to see of course they, we were manipulating things what are they doing and the owner of the home came and said what are you doing and he said you know martin <laughs> brought back my friend robert to life but not in that way like he's doing something on his own but it's quite nice i like his museum it's amazing these were his words and he said you know Martin, I have something for your museum. And then he took out of his like trousers from his pocket and he said, this is for you. And then the curator said, like, but what is the story of this piece? Because every piece in Martin's museum has a story. And then he said, no, I won't tell it. It's too emotional. No. And then, he, then uh, the whole, luckily for me, the whole table was like, come on, tell it, tell it, tell it, tell it, tell it. A little bit like childish, a little drunk, I don't know. And then he was like, no, not telling it. Tell it, tell it. And then the curator that invited us, who was very smart and emotionally smart, she said to him, maybe you can whisper it to my ear. And he said, okay, yeah, I can do that. And he whispered it to her ear. And then the whole table that we want to know, tell it, tell it. And he said, okay, she can tell it, but in English, so Martin understand. We were speaking German, French, like it was a mixture, it was chaotic. I wouldn't understand if not. And then she said, okay, like she can tell it, but in English. And here comes the story. And I want it to be the, not the last story of the night, but one before the last piece. So he told the following, this piece that you have in your hand was brought to Daniel Spuri by a German artist. I'm trying to follow the words that were said that night. This artist came to Daniel Spuri to visit him at his studio to show him her work. She was a, a young German artist. And she brought many different works to show Daniel and they like, had lunch together. She brought this Buddha as a present, and they were talking about her work. So Daniel was kind of like doing lunch, talking about what she was doing. She would 
a little bit studio visit like but in his apartment in his in his studio and at one point of the night they were seeing all the things yeah like reviewing the stuff and then she looked at him and she asked the following question am i an important artist what he didn't know where this come from like where did, did this come from Am I an important artist? And he said, um, yeah, well, give me an answer, she demanded. And he said, well, yeah, if I have to be honest, I would have to say no. No. What? No, I think you're interesting. I think like the relationship of your life, your work is super interesting. I have had super fun. I have enjoyed today. But if I have to give an answer to that question, I have to say no. She was furious. She took the Buddha, she slammed it on the floor, she took all her work, closed the door, pah, slammed it as well, and never came back. And don't tell me why, Daniel Spuri said, but he felt very bad. And he explained, I wanted to explain her, important for whom? What kind of question is that? I don't think there is something important. Important maybe for you, or important maybe for you, or important for an institution, for a social class, for a culture, but I don't think there is something per se important, he said. But I couldn't explain it, and she just left, and it happened so fast. And like the thing is that for him it was quite a, a burden, but from that day he was carrying the Buddha in his pocket. So for six months that Buddha was part of his daily life. And he said that it was quite heavy. And that day he said, Martin, I think in your museum it will be better kept. And that's the story of the Blue Buddha. I haven't presented it in a while because at the beginning I was tempted. There are some pieces in the collection that I feel they are kind of favorites or they become favorite pieces. But that's also tempting because you stop showing the others. And then there are pieces that you never show. So I try to keep a balance, like representation of the different artists in the collection. And in the case of uh, Daniel, at one point it was kind of favorite for um, like one year, and then I stopped it a little. So I haven't presented it in a long time. But even though this question also made me think a lot about the collection, important for whom, who is important, what are you presenting? Sometimes we also give a lot of attention to big names, to these big ideas. And what happens with the small ideas? Sometimes they could also be interesting. Once I had to present the whole collection in th different sessions. For the first one, I had my big favorite pieces for me. The second, there were still some that were interesting. For the third time, I was very nervous. I was just had the leftovers. But it resulted that that was the best presentation. The people who were present loved it much more. There were more many like associations, people were really connecting. And I discovered that there were some pieces that I dismissed. I don't know why. Because I had fixed ideas. So yeah, I tried to keep track of what I'm showing and then I tried to... I want to just tell you that this bag is made by Bisha Sombra. And Bisha is also making bags, but is also a great artist. I wanted to have a bag to differentiate the pieces when I'm bringing them to another city, or sometimes I'm carrying some stuff. And she sent this bag that she designed and she made herself with these little beings. You can see the bag as well. I thought that it was quite nice that she made this turtle shield. I love this idea of the turtle. You know, they have their home with themselves and they can carry it in the... Do you know like this question, what would you carry if you need to run, if you need to go away from your place? What would you bring? I think I could bring my whole museum. <laughs> 
maybe it sounds a little tragicomic, but I would do it. And even though I have talked to you a lot about stories that I carry and that I conservate, I had one artist that posed me a very interesting uh, dilemma. This is a piece that I never shown before by Denis Unal. I met Denis recently in Germany for an art residency and we spent four months together and we had the greatest breakfast ever. I had a lot of fun with Denis. Denis do, uh, does a lot of performance. She's based in London. She was born in Turkey. So she goes and comes back. But she's quite London, London person. And you know she works a lot with improvisation. And yeah, like things that come up. And she said that she was going to give me a piece that had a um, somehow like a expired date. So she said that this piece won't be forever in the collection. So she said that this piece had like some a secret, but if I reveal the secret, it's no longer the piece. So this is a piece that I can just show once. And then it will be gone. So the secret is inside. And she asked me to crush the egg in order to see the secret. So, yeah, today will be the moment. And you will be part of this one-time piece. <laughs> so as she came into the collection, she will go out. But I'm also very curious about it. <laughs> Can I ask you some of the pieces back? I don't want to lose more than one this night. <laughs> if you want to see them, I will still leave them here for a while. So. Yes. You know that many times that I, this museum, as I told you, I present in spontaneous situations, but some others I present in institutions, like in CASC, they are quite uh, welcoming, but they are also flexible, but it has also been presented in museums. And sometimes they worry a lot about this question. What we, do we do? Should, how should we insure the museum? And you are giving it away. This is problematic for the insurance and so on. And my answer, my provisional answer, is that I want to go with the risk of showing them to you, but because I think that it's very important that you can touch them, that you can manipulate them. So I know that there is a risk. There could be someone taking one of the pieces. Actually, there have been three times in the history of the museum that pieces have been lost. Two of these three times, they were found back. So one time, it was a piece by Mark Buchi called Fiducia that I presented the museum in a bar at night. And the next morning, it wasn't there, the piece. It's like a folded coin. And I came back to the bar, like I look everywhere. I had consumed very moderate uh, quantities of alcohol. I was really not really drunk. But then still, like it went missing. 
And I even contact the artist and say, maybe we can redo the piece. But then luckily it appeared. It was folded inside another piece. The second time it happened with a piece by Stephanie Sade that was presented in the MACBA, in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Barcelona. And half of the collection was shown in the hat and half in the locker rooms. So visitors could open with the keys. And don't ask me why, her piece that was a lock, a welded lock, disappeared. And by chance, that day I like informed the, the artist that I was going to present it, and the only person who wrote me back was Stephanie. Hey, Martin, wish you all of the lags, and her work was lost. And the thing is that for three days it was completely lost, but then we told the people in the museum, and there was one guard who came with the piece. Three days later, he never explained how he found it. And there was a third piece by Luis Valdez that was a little straw hat. And it was presented in Amsterdam, and it stayed for a few days, the museum, so it was not like this, that is just one moment. But then after the performance, they stayed in a platform as an installation, and somebody took this little hat, and that was gone. So yeah, like you have to run the risk if you want to open the collection but I think it's worthy. Until now, it's very minor what has been lost in a way. You know, sometimes I say that I am a museum director or I do the guided tour as I have been doing it today, but I also do the cleaning of this museum and I am also part of the conservation department. So I am quite like, Schizo in terms that I have different functions, and sometimes the functions oppose each other. So the more performatic or guided tour or the education department wants to show the pieces and hand them out, but then there is also the conservation department that says, yeah, but what if it happens this and that? And sometimes, for example, I sweat and I, the pieces get wet. And sometimes, like there, yeah, many factors that make the pieces to not be in the optimal conditions to be saved. So, but it's part of the museum. A couple of times, particularly in Amsterdam. <laughs> there is a, a writer that once went to a presentation in Barcelona. She's called Arenita, she called herself. And she wrote a story in which the Hat Museum would fall while riding in the bike. So there is this character that has a, a hat museum and was riding uh, his bike or her bike. And then the hat fell. And all, like she described how all the pieces while arriving in the outside somehow merge with the whole reality. So she said that there is a glitch and there is like a bread maker doing bread. And suddenly, like, the bread become art, and all its surrounding become art. And then the whole, like, uh, bakery becomes an artwork. And she described this in a very ludic and funny way. But I think she has somehow a point. So there is something that what you indicate as art could become art. But it's not just what you indicate. So there also needs to be somehow, like, a threshold. There is, needs to be somehow a process until you get to the aesthetic experience, if you want. And for me, that's through the hat. So today, for example, I did this introduction to you about the crosswords. It makes sense to me because that's how I found it. But it's also about like creating the ambience, the atmosphere, so you can also come to listen to the story. So yeah, it's about, it's a little bit like curating something. You need to select something in order to see it. But of course there is this other pole of exclusion. So if you select too much, it's always the same story, you stop telling other stories. So yeah, for me, I'm always like trying to balance between these poles. Do you think it's the moment? It's the moment. Okay.
There is some hair here. Oh, and we have been talking a lot about hair. <laughs> I didn't know about it. Yeah, thank you for coming to this uh, presentation. <laughs> Yes, and I learned very fast that I don't need to wear the museum, nor tell that it's a museum. <laughs> because the first time I was wearing it with the pieces inside, and they were like, what is this? It's a museum that I do. Say, <laughs> Come here. Like, <laughs> then there was like a, yeah, I have to say that they were still gentle, but it's better to, so yeah. I also have it with many artworks that I transport of my practice in general that I sometimes I know it's better not to explain your ideas but in airports particularly to be quite straightforward it's an egg with some flower I don't know like it's a balloon <laughs> but or yeah it's like a lapis lazuli figure it, it, well it results to be a Buddha okay yeah it was given by Daniel Spur in this dinner but then it yeah it's kind of they don't like these kind of things they start to yeah, they think you're like kind of mad or they, they start to look more into the things you have, but they are not looking for stories. So then it's better not to say too much. Today I had a funny moment. I just was like reviewing the pieces that I was bringing and there was the, in the, like in the border between Belgium and the Netherlands that you never noticed. And they came like many police officers with a dog. And they were demanding all the people on the train to lo put their backs down. And suddenly I found myself surrounded by five police officers, a dog, and I was with all these things in the like, tables of the train. And I look at them, and then they look at me. <laughs> and I, was, I, I just continued like, writing what I was writing. But I got very nervous, even though it's absurd, it's nothing. But, but still you get nervous. And then I continue, and then one look at me, and I was like, and then the dog didn't care, so they, they went away. Luckily, the dog didn't care. Uh, but yes, sometimes there are problems. But you weren't sure what was in the eggs. Hmm? You weren't sure what was in the eggs. I didn't have any idea. So that's the thing. Well, I still don't know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it was implicated in something without knowing. Yeah. There is a lot of trust in this museum. I have to say that I have never said no to a piece. But that doesn't mean that I don't have a curatorial approach. But I told you that at the beginning I invited people, but then there were many people coming to me. And like nowadays I would say that there are more people coming than people that I invite. And they come and they say, I have this for the museum. And at the beginning, I thought, wow, it's amazing. But sometimes there was a moment in which there was something that I didn't want. And that was also a big ethical question. What should I do with that? And my way of dealing with it was not to say no, but was to say, why not? I would love to have it, but there is something that disturbs me. Or I have stomach ache with this particular feature of your what you want to give me. And that I realized that sometimes it's not about saying no, but starting a conversation. So I have had long conversations. There are some pieces that are still like being talked about, but at the end I have the feeling that those pieces became the best ones because it's also like they became a, a relationship. So yeah, it's like a ever going thing in a way. I'm still talking with many of the uh, contributors to this museum, except for a few that I just met roughly, or f there are two that pass away recently. So then, yeah, there is still like all, all this kind of situation. No, but there is this idea of having categories, but I'm, sometimes I'm against categories. But yeah, as Godard presented me, I come from this artist book platform called Good Neighbor. And in Good Neighbor, we like to associate things. 
a little bit when we say large edible fish and we have an image and then we have a thing and like this game with words. And in the museum, you tend to do the same. So for example, there is this Vicente piece with the teeth and there is another piece that has to do with dental situations by uh, Anna Banana, a male artist that sent like a, a, not a cavity, but not a teeth, but the, and how do you call it? The, what the dentist puts when you have a cavity, they put a filler, yeah. So she sent a filler that fell out from her molar. So it's inevitable to connect them by, or for example, Toshiko and Tatsuo for me are very nice to show together. So there are like certain pieces that have start to build their own categories by themselves. For example, there is a piece by Rodrigo Hernandez and another piece by Ana Navas, and I know they are very good friends, so sometimes I tend to show them together. Or there are these pieces, for example, there is a piece by Dong Yong Lee that are like uh, shoes for fingers. And inside those, I save little, little pieces, so they become themselves like a collection. So yeah, it's all the time happening, but I try to avoid to do it like very uh, definitive. And every time I do a curatorial work, so for example, today I was thinking, when, when I have program presentations, I try to like review these things that I was telling you. So sometimes like to balance the who have been presented and who has not, if there is some connection to the building, to the space, to the city, to someone that's coming, or yeah. I, in that sense, that could be a category, but maybe more temporal, provisional. I had to maybe make it as a category for the museum. That's a good idea. <laughs> I think it could be. Maybe you can help me. <laughs> Yes, there have been some thematic shows and sometimes also shows for a particular context. So there, I have been asked to do a show for a show, which seems a little bit absurd, but like, so sometimes there are like people doing an exhibition and they ask me to do somehow a, a little exhibition that reflects on the artworks in that show, for example. So I choose uh, works that could talk to the works in that other show. Or there have been times in which yeah, I have been asked, like, can you do like a, an exhibition, a museum presentation about the diaspora or about a movement? Uh, or can you do, and yeah, sometimes I like to do it. But also to, a little bit as you say, to use this kind of category that can give order to the collection. Actually, like now with Kiosk, part of my, our collaboration is not just the Metropolis M advertisement and not just these presentations that I have been doing here in Ghent, because I have been coming several times. So this, we presented the museum, another museum building in the Citadel Park, in, the, in a kiosk. There, there is like this kind of pagoda-like kiosk. I presented it there. But I have also been coming like normal days, just with the hat. We don't tell anyone. I just walk through the city, I go, I take a coffee, and I am wearing the hat and carrying some pieces. And that's a, our second collaboration. And there is a third collaboration that we're thinking and like doing a website for the Museology team. Because the Museology team needs some kind of communication. I am starting to have, it's very practical. Like I receive invitations to present the museum. And sometimes it also demands, yeah, it's work, it's like a labor. I need to go, I need to uh, present, like I need to prepare, it's curatorial work as well, like cleaning all the stuff that I need to do. And as well, the museum needs to, like more and more people ask about it. And I, till now, I don't have an official site for the museum. I just like through my uh, social networks, I talk about it. In my website, you can find a little bit about it. I talk about it in, as an artist, as part of my art practice. But I would like it to be a little bit independent, also to organize it better. And part of that is making a website. And in this website, we're thinking of how can we make these kind of playful categories. And we're also thinking how not to replace the experience that you had today. 
So for me, this is, you came to the museology team, or both, the museology team also came to you. You were museum visitors today, and you were also part of the whole presentation. But I don't want to take that out, for example, in a website. So we're thinking how not to replace this physical experience of having the pieces, of seeing them, of like, yeah, being in the same room, sharing a temporality. So we want to do a website that can somehow tell about the reality of the museum, but without trying to, like, yeah, be the reality. So that you don't just search the website and you say, ah, the museum team, I understood. Yeah, I know. Museum in a half, yeah. It's gone but still that you have some hint. And for me, it's also quite important to name the artist. So every time that I present, that's also one my promise to the contributors. I will tell their name if they want to be named. And I will try to be fair to their stories. Even though I have to say that I also put a lot of my own storytelling. But I try to be loyal to what they, give, they gave me. showing me or I don't really want to see this and because of course there's layers of people's interest and my thought was that which is that indeed of this like archival that uh, can like can also retain temporal temporality um, I thought uh, okay maybe a newsletter could be quite interesting but it's still in a, in a digital form but I find that this kind of it's in a very a cheerful sense like news hey you have like uh, a new artist that is uh, that's like uh, you know getting into the collection and so it could be kind of like I don't know like a very like a new form of wow it's funny I <coughs> sorry I never thought of a, news a newsletter but it's actually a great idea like to have some kind of periodical information about the museum try to archive a collection and they make publications on the base of this and like the history of who they work with and collaborate but since this has a different form uh, and also a newsletter it's just a bit of something that could um, yeah mm, be taken a bit more lightheartedly but also in the same sense grasp this this energy of I you know like this museum is very mobile and this also can like retain its kind of mobility but be accessible to everyone no definitely no i think it's a great idea actually i'm thinking of the website a little bit like we want to do like a chance experience that you don't confront all the stories at once nor all the story so we want still to list all the artworks in the collection but that every time that you access you have access to one story and we want to use the voice because since the like oral tradition is very important in this museum it's also that's also my resistance to writing everything down that it becomes somehow fixed or more fixed than the voice that is like something that is more in flux is in movement like we take it and we use it and we change it in a way so maybe it would be interesting to think of this newsletter as a possibility, how to think a newsletter that could be attractive and still say without being so fixed. But I like this idea of a periodical something. And also I even thought, okay, but maybe it doesn't, it couldn't, it should, maybe it doesn't have to be an email, but it could, could be post. Yeah. And then it, it does have a physical form, but that requires production and fun. Exactly. So, I think it's super interesting to consider, you know, in a way, what I'm doing every time when I present it is somehow doing this newsletter in terms that I am like also opening to like the different, like the new works and I am actually 
updating the stories and they are changing and I'm telling some things that go on all the time the same, like some features of how this museum work. But for example, also the museum might have presented it as a podcast for Corona times, for example, or for instance, they interview me and they ask me about the works and I talk about them so they become part of a magazine or an article or sometimes it, it has also like this kind of different, it appears in different shapes, but maybe it would be nice to regain this shape and make it on our own. Maybe once it's an uh, email newsletter, then it's a printed one that is sent to play with this idea, I think is great. I'm actually working exactly on that, how to communicate. Because now, yeah, I do an institution, I become a museum, but of course, it's an institution that started as if it is a museum. So I'm also not a museum. But I am, as, I am repeating the idea of being a museum that it becomes an actual museum. So nowadays, like the Museum Legitim is seen by others as a museum. I have been invited to these heritage uh, seminars with museum directors. And they say, oh yeah, what, uh, you, what, is you, what are you director from? Like, ah yeah, I'm the director of the Museum of History of Amsterdam. And you? Ah no, I'm the director of Museum Legitim. And where is that? Well, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm carrying, yeah. and then it starts the conversation. So it's interesting because when you start to play with the fiction of being a museum, <laughs> at one point it can become real. Because this institution is all about repetition. So what makes cask, cask? That many times we have heard cask, 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 cask auditorium, cask conservatorium. Ah, I'm studying at cask. I will start, we will do this year round. Ah, yeah, she studied at cask. Ah, they, and then like the fact of having students, having teachers, repeating that year after year, make cask be cask. And it's funny because like the society, there could be hundreds of like social changes, things change a lot if we see the last hundred of years. But if we go to the universities or study places, we still have students and we still have teachers. And even though there are many things that have changed, actually many things have also not changed. And that's also something interesting about institutions, and particularly also about the museum. The museum can renew its face, its walls, but it remains somehow very museum. And in a way, I play with this idea of being a museum also to put into question these things. And I like, thanks for your proposal, because I also like this idea that you need to also say, I'm a museum. Do you want to hear the newsletter? Hey, we are doing this. Hey, this is happening. So this also gives life to the museum. And museum gift shop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks to you.